What's going on, everyone? Welcome on into another episode of Golf on Tap. As always, I'm Jack Bushman, joined by Ross Barron. Today, we'll be getting into Peter Melnati stealing the show at Copperhead over the weekend. The man with the bucket hat and the yellow ball, my good old Missouri Tiger brother, getting the win over Cameron Young and a slew of other players. We'll also talk about Justin Thomas's disaster on the greens over the weekend. Keith Mitchell melting down on Sunday, unfortunately. And of course, a preview of this week's 2024 Texas Children's Houston Open as we're now just two weeks away from the Masters at Augusta National. It's starting to creep in. PGA Tour departs from Florida and heads to Texas. But before we get into all this good stuff, Ross, it wasn't, you know, a star-studded leaderboard over the weekend. And we made several jokes in our group chat about the, the way it was shaping up in the final round at the Valspar Championship. It actually wound up being a pretty compelling Sunday. Of course, an awesome story with Peter Malnati getting it done. Ross, how you doing this afternoon? And what were your thoughts on uh, the final round of the Valspar Championship? Well, once again, we had snow again last week, so still still stuck in that. But at least got to sit down and watch this leaderboard that I could not take my eyes off the leaderboard for the fact that you and I were talking off camera when there was a good probably 12, 13 holes to play. And when you looked at looked at the board itself, there was like 25 guys that legitimately had a shot to still finish the round low and post something going into the clubhouse and have a shot. And, and no, it was not the names we're, we're used to. It, it's not the names that put asses in the seats, but it was still fu- it was still fun to watch for the fact that we had an event where legitimately going into Sunday, there were about 30 guys that anyone could go low and put a competitive score on the board going into the clubhouse where, yeah, we were joking around in our group chat saying, is Xander about to fire, you know, fire fire nine under and then have to sit in the clubhouse for three hours to see if he wins typical Xander fashion, a little backdoor. Don't know if it was a top four or a top five or what it officially went down as on the leaderboard, but the classic Xander making it look like it was close and he was in contention, even though he really was, was never in the mix. Although there, there was like maybe a 30 to 45 minute stretch, like you said, where it was like, okay, maybe Xander has an opportunity here but just so many other guys had so many holes left, like you mentioned. And it wasn't just, you know, Peter Malnati and Cameron Young, who we'll get to here in just a second, but Mackenzie Hughes was right there as well. Carl Yuan was chipping in from all over the place. He had three hole outs in his opening 15 holes. Um, Chandler Phillips was there fighting back and forth. Of course, Keith Mitchell uh, was someone who started the day in the lead, but didn't have his best go of it. But yeah, just a lot of, different players and a lot of different player types and a lot of different storylines. And I thought that's what made it such an excellent Sunday. And also I thought uh, Copperhead proved to be just such a fantastic course. And I love the difficulty of it. I love how nothing's easy out there, but it's not favoring one specific type of player. And that's what makes it so intriguing and what led to Peter Malnati as a 300 to one um 300 to one man pre-tournament ends up winning this bad boy, but what a spectacular story that is for, for old stinky Pete, as I call him, who's no longer playing stinky. That's why I gave him the nickname. Cause it was a little bit of a tough skid for him there for a couple of years, but quietly, even before the win Ross, he, he finished in the top 10 at the cognizant classic was 16th at the waste management Phoenix open. I don't know if I, I want to say that maybe we should have seen this coming from Peter Malnati because it had been since November of 2015 since he actually took down a tournament, but he had been playing some pretty good golf and watching him in that final round, he played some really good golf as well, but also had some funny, like relatable type of moments topping uh, the, the fairway wood on the fifth hole, I believe. And then also just clearly having the jitters and being a little nervous out there. You could see that he was antsy and um, was having a hard time kind of keeping himself settled in between shots and um, was still able to manage his way through all of those emotions and through all those difficulties and ended up stealing this thing with an incredible birdie at the 17th part of the snake pit, which is one of the most grueling three hole stretches on the PGA tour. He goes and makes a two there and ends up uh, just having to, he only had to make a five to get the job done in the last hole ends up rolling in a four 
And then all the emotions start pouring out. A super cool interview where he he shared the insight behind what it's like to be a not so common name on the PGA Tour and someone that's, you know, gone almost a decade without winning and what it's just truly like to be grinding day in and day out and how hard it is. Yeah, it's his dream job, like he said, but life is super hard and there's obstacles along the way for all different sorts of people. And it, it was just awesome to see Peter Malnati persevere through all of that. Um, a huge underdog that no one was expecting to pull through. Hard not to feel good for for Peter Malnati and, and feel like you could also kind of relate to him throughout those rounds. It felt like he was kind of one of us out there playing on that Sunday, Ross. Oh, a- absolutely. I mean, I- I'm a I'm a sucker for a guy that you know he 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 wins. He's he's sitting there on the green. First thing he's doing is where are my kids? Just ha- having having that moment. Um, it, it's all it's all just come together to be such such a cool thing to see. Was and especially a guy like Peter Milnati, w- which undeniably he's one of the most well liked and well respected players on the tour no, every if you looked at all like the post round interviews no one has anything but positive things to say about their experiences with peter Milnati. no one th- there's nothing but good things to say so you can just see what kind of ambassador he is and it's part of the reason he's on the board for for, for the players that he he is the common golfer he he kind of represents everyone everyone understands and he is kind of the perfect person to be on that board where yeah, this was his first win in almost a decade. And like you were saying, you know, when he did his interview, it was hard to kind of sit there and watch and see the emotions pour out for him being like, you know, it is a dream job, but life is hard. And you you sit there and you just don't know, am I ever going to get back here again? Yeah, it, it was a, a tearjerker interview for sure out of Peter Malnati, an easy guy to root for and, yeah, someone who who just feels like the common golfer and doesn't live in the limelight very often and has a selfless job on the PGA Tour policy board being, you know, someone who's an advocate on behalf of the players. And that's not a job a lot of people like to do. I mean, we've seen multiple people have to step away from that because, you know, golf is just a game where you got to be so dialed in and so focused and can't really have all of that outside noise. Well, being part of the policy board is certainly opening up uh, ways to be distracted and just get away from your own golf game. And for Peter Malnati to be part of that and care so much about the tour so deeply, and then to go in and do this, uh, it was super awesome to see, man. Um, couldn't help, but obviously root for the guy down the stretch. I know I had a little Mizzou bias there, but he ends up getting it done. His second career PGA tour win. Peter Malnati is going to be going to Augusta National for the first time in his career in a couple of weeks' time. Unbelievable. Not sure how that's going to go for him, but I know he's going to have a big smile on his face all throughout as many holes as he's going to play there. But, Ross, not not only is Peter Malnati, obviously he was the main talking point from this, coming away with the win, the super awesome interview, his son on his shoulder while he's talking and laying on his uh, laying his head on his shoulder, I thought was super touching. But there are also a bunch of other notable storylines that are, are worth getting into here on the show, but none more notable than Cameron Young picking up his seventh career runner-up finish on the PGA Tour. And this one has to sting in a little bit of a different way than the others do, because when you go and look at most of Cameron Young's runner-ups in his career, it's at some big boy events, and he's losing to some of the best golfers in the entire world. This week, he really just had to yeah, there were a lot of guys in the mix, but he's certainly the highest caliber player that was in the group. And really, by the end of it, he just had to outduel Peter Malnati and Mackenzie Hughes, and he still wasn't able to get the job done. And I think a little bit more concerning than that, the game was was pretty good for Cameron Young, right? He didn't get the job done, but playing some good golf, you know, finished inside the top 20, I want to say, in all four Florida events. But what concerned me personally the most, Ross, was hearing Cameron Young speak after this tournament, talking about how he knew he already wasn't going to win. And on a Sunday down the stretch in golf, that's literally the last mentality that you want to have. And for him to be so open about it and so adamant that 
it was like an okay mindset to have when, listen, buddy, we got Peter Melnati backing you up. Not exactly a known closer on the PGA tour. The guy hadn't won a tournament in almost a decade and, you know, one wayward drive on 18. And he's talking about how he knew he already wasn't going to win. I, I just thought that was so concerning to hear out of Cameron Young and to add that to my personal experiences watching Cameron Young on a golf course. And I think some people don't know that Cameron Young, and I will say I've only seen him at one tournament before, but it was in multiple rounds. So maybe it was just a bad week for him, but he was just running super hot and it felt like he, he just didn't have the best control over his emotions. And as like calm and emotionless as he seems in interviews that's not really how it seems to me when he's out on the golf course and to hear those comments on top of it and you know the stuff that he was saying about whatever emotions you know he has what he's gonna feel when he's driving home with his one and two year old kids it's just like it just doesn't sound like the mind of a guy who's ready to win PGA tour events. And listen, I think Cameron young is eventually going to get the job done. I'll be okay with missing out on it in the betting market. I'll, I'll wait to see it happen. I know how talented he is, but this kind of mindset, hearing him express himself like this, it, it was very concerning to me, Ross. And I know you felt the same. What were, what were your thoughts about it? Um. So, and I quote, you talked all week about how well you handled your emotions. What are your emotions now? I don't know, honestly. I realized I wasn't going to win pretty quickly, and I have a four-hour drive home with a one- and two-year-old, so whatever emotions are attached to that. That's a defeated man. That is a defeated man right there. That That is a beyond defeated man to me. That is a man that I... I don't see winning anytime soon. And it, and it's to me, it's a shame because like we've talked about multiple times where, yes, we refuse to put him in our picks until we see him come around. The game is there. The talent is there. He can hang with the big boys. But when you have this mental block or cloud like that, I don't see how he's ever going to put it together until he figures that shit out. And, and also considering how hard it is to win a golf tournament on the PGA tour in today's day and age. And that's what made Peter Malnati's win so special and why he was so filled with those emotions because he, he mentioned it's tougher than ever to win out here. Even with live, the game is still deeper than it's ever been. And these guys are ready to win just like that. You need to be so dialed in and so focused and, and so precise through 72 holes to actually win one of these things just having one of those little mental lapses is all it takes for everything to completely unravel. And I feel like Cameron Young, and this is just an opinion, I don't know this for fact, but I feel like the talent has gotten him to this point because it's there, man. The guy hits the ball a mile, tears up par fives. The swing is beautiful. Um, when he putts, it goes really well for him. That doesn't happen very often, but he does have putting upside. Like the game is there, but I just feel like the mental side of things hasn't cooperated him, cooperated with him fully through a four day event enough to win. And, and that's just, it's just what's required to win in today's PGA tour. And for Cameron Young to not be able to do it in, in this type of field, man, Look, second place at, at the open at the US Open or at the Open Championship and at the PGA Championship behind some of these big names, right? Like you, you get respect and you get confidence from that. But this one I feel like is has the potential to do the opposite to Cameron Young. And hearing how he talked about it after his round, man, it, it didn't give me any positive kind of momentum feeling about him moving forward. And I do think it's going to come. I, I think it's going to come eventually. Winning is hard. We've seen it with uh with, with young, talented players time and time again. But I, I agree with you. I'm just not inclined to believe it's going to be happening in the next couple of months until he makes a serious attitude change because I just feel like he's not able to get himself dialed in and, and not be able to – push away those outside distractions or those wandering thoughts enough to go and get the job done. And like you said, it, it is a shame because the talent is there. Um, but I, I really think he just needs a change in mindset and a change in attitude for, for something to actually 
click enough for him to get over that final hurdle and finally pick up that first PGA Tour win. Yeah, I, I could not could not agree more. Just it 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 just becomes a shame because we can see the talent is undeniable. We, every any given week, he has the capability in the game to win any one of these events, and it's just coming to the point where you know as we make our picks and we make our predictions. I just, I don't put him in there. I don't even give him a real true shot because I I just don't believe it. It, Yes, on paper, he could be the best player in the field next week. I'm not still, I'm not going to put him in my top five. I just can't trust it until I personally see it. But at the same point in time, there's no denying seven runner-up finishes and it's probably 20, 23, 24 ish months now for Cameron Young on the PGA Tour. And as we just mentioned, it is deeper than ever. So it's nothing to bat an eye at, but it just goes to show again how difficult it truly is to win these days. And uh, yeah, definitely tough to see Cameron Young not be able to come through in such a golden opportunity for him for for him to pick up that elusive first victory on the PGA Tour. It was a good week though for Cameron Young. Not the not the end result that he wanted, but he has been playing some better golf. Who wasn't a good weekend for Ross though was good old Justin Thomas. And I was someone who bet Justin Thomas at the players championship and didn't end up backing him uh, going into this past week at the Valspar. And after seeing what he did through the opening 36 holes, I was like, it's just going to be another week. Like it's been all season long for betting on the PGA tour. I'm going to bet on someone and they're going to go ahead and be in contention the next week. And it looked like that was going to be the case for Justin Thomas came out on, on Saturday. He was two shots off the lead when he started birdied the easy par five first to get things going and was just one shot off the lead and then absolute disaster struck Ross. He ended up missing five putts within five feet in a seven hole stretch, lost seven strokes putting in a single round by far the worst strokes putting round of his PGA tour career and just absolutely lost it over the weekend. And Considering the start that Justin Thomas got off to this year and how he rebounded late last season going and playing at the Fortinet Championship prior to the Ryder Cup and actually being one of the few United States players to bring their A game there in Rome and then rattling off top 10s and top 15s to kick off the new year. He goes and misses the cut at the Players' Championship, a place he's never missed the cut at in his entire career, and then has this type of weekend at the Valspar you at least have to be a little bit worried about where Justin Thomas is trending, right? Considering the downfall that he went through last year. Yes, he absolutely looked like he was back, but these last two weekends have been, or last two weeks have just been not Justin Thomas like as we've seen to get off the new year. And, and for everyone that was high on the comeback trail, you got to have some concerns right now, right? Oh, I, I think it's undeniable that we have to be concerned as we're heading into major season. I know I w- when I was watching over the weekend, there was one point that ESPN had the coverage, and it, I believe, uh, I believe it was, it might have been, yes, yes, yesterday morning, possibly we were watching, and we were just laughing that he was one of the early, early players off, and he hits it to about a foot and a half. And there's the team is just breaking this down that it's about a foot and a half, but it's going to, it's going to be quick and it's going to be the left. And the one guy just comes out and says, yeah, but it's Justin and Justin will just have the confidence. He's going to go ahead and knock this down. And I just start laughing and look at Emily and go, he's going to miss. <laughs> and, lit- <laughs> and, lit- and, lit- and literally rolls it right by. And you just hear the guy go, Oh, I mean, he's missing putts from inside a foot. He missed a 10 incher on Saturday. He's missing gimmies out here. And I, I posted the clips, you know, on social media. I do feel a little bad on uh, doing that on behalf of Justin Thomas. But the interactions that you get with people on the internet of, of missed short putts, it's like, oh my God, it's one of us. This guy is human, but. Man, for Justin Thomas, this has to scare you because these were the major issues that he was partially dealing with last year and really has been the part of his game that's kind of always prevented him from winning. You know, the Irons are are still relatively good and they were really good at the Players' Championship. But if he's putting like that, he's got absolutely no shot, especially with the Masters in two weeks. I, I don't know 
how anyone can feel that confidently about Justin Thomas going into Augusta this year. Yeah, I, I definitely am not. He's not, as of right now, not going to be on my big board. But if he wants to prove me wrong, I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be mad about seeing Justin Thomas in a green jacket. Right. I'm always a rooter for JT, but you know he's probably going to have a number below 30 to 1. And for me personally, it's like, I just don't think he's in the form to go and win the Masters like we've kind of seen that's been required to go and put on that green jacket. You need to be in some good form. And Justin Thomas with uh, a miscut and basically a DFL after making the cut at the Valspar. Yeah, definitely not the weekend that he was hoping for. Not the Sunday that Keith Mitchell was looking for either, Ross. And, man, you had to feel for Cashmere Keith and right off the rip it was pretty clear that he was going to be dealing with the Sunday scaries and that's always my concern about Keith Mitchell for anyone out there who, who's tuning in and has been listening to our um, uh, golf on tap betting show Joey Ricotta loves betting Keith Mitchell and I go man I just worry about Keith in contention because every time I see him on Sunday the best part of his game abandons, abandons him, and it's the long and accurate driver. And he was missing every fairway right off the rip, Ross. None worse, though, than, than the first hole. He literally hit it into the parking lot and still somehow gets a free drop, man. I, I don't understand that. I don't get how the parking lot is out of bounds, but it was clear right, right there and then that it was going to be a very tough day for Keith. And he kind of even had some magic beans on the uh, back nine on Saturday going six under in his final six holes. He holds out from the fairway for Eagle. Um, but, but yeah, wound up not being the Sunday that Keith Mitchell wanted, not the Sunday that Seamus power wanted either that final pairing shot 11 over combined. And we're really never in the mix what were your kind of thoughts about Keith Mitchell, unfortunately, not having his best stuff on Sunday and being unable to close the job once again? I mean, you, you said it right there with that that final pairing. I don't know how closely you paid attention to the coverage, but by the time they reached like the fifth hole, we did not see Seamus or Keith the remainder of the day. They they pretty much just found their camera crew and said, you guys don't need to follow them anymore. It's, it's, yeah. it's okay. I think the only other time they they really showed them was uh, when Keith hit it into the drink on the par three. I don't know exactly what hole it was. It might have been like 12 or something. He hit it into the drink and made double, and then Seamus Power somehow made triple. And it was like, oh, my God, these guys are absolutely crumbling. And then I completely forgot, like, because, as you said, the broadcast had just written them off like they didn't exist. They still had to go and finish 18 after Peter Melnati won the freaking thing. That had to be the most awkward thing ever for Keith Mitchell and for Seamus Power, walking up 18 when everyone's celebrating Peter Melnati, and they're like, oh, yeah, these two clowns are still playing right now. Oh, yeah, these, these, these guys got a putt out still as Peter's getting a trophy and everything right off the side of the green. And you know no one's giving a shit about, like, yelling and, and cheering and stuff. And Keith's just probably got his head down, man. I feel so bad for Keith. It was – he couldn't make any long par saves. He was in the trees with every drive and had to chip out. And um, he, he's talked about how, you know, he kind of gets down on himself when things aren't going good for him on Sunday. And it seemed like he was really down on himself early, even though, like, if he righted the ship, he did still have a chance. But in those moments, it's like – it, it really is hard to get back on, on the track when it's going that wayward for him, you know? it. I mean, it felt like he was dead in the water on, dead that, fish. First, uh, uh, on that first hole because they're showing Peter Melnati and everyone, oh, we'll jump up to hole four. All right, let's go back. And it's 25 minutes later. It's let's go back to Keith, Keith Mitchell is – Still in the parking lot. He's still trying to figure out where he can drop this ball and take relief. It was literally like a 20 minute thing where after his drive, like they're trying to figure out what to do with this ball where the next group is legitimately like almost three holes ahead. Dude, I, I, I really am though starting to get upset with some of the drops that these guys get. And it's like the, again, it, it just goes back to the PGA tour and, and, they don't make the rules, so I, I understand that they're just in, they're just following the rules. But it feels like the rules are so player friendly this day and age. Like, there's no way Keith Mitchell should be hitting it to the parking lot off of the first tee box, and he's still able to make a five. And 
I mean, yeah, that is a stroke penalty because everyone is making four there, but still there's no way he should be coming out of that hole with par. And there are just too many circumstances where, where these guys get away with simple things like that. It ended up working in Peter Malnati's favor on 16. And again, that is the rules, but it's like, man, it, it, and I'm not having a gripe with it. It's just, there's worse situations than the Peter Malnati ones. The ones where it's like, yeah, hitting your ball into the parking lot or Scotty Scheffler getting a free drop because there's like a tower line in his way. There there are some egregious drops uh, on the PGA Tour for sure. Oh, yeah. I, I, I completely agree. I think there's, um, you can almost say weekly, we see a shot where you and I in our, in our group text, they're just like, what the hell was that? Where does that ruling come from? Yeah, I like, I thought he was dead, but all of a sudden he's back and, oh, now he's got 40 feet on the green for birdie. It's like, what? Like, I thought this dude was f- surefire about to make a five. What's going on? <laughs> so, so, some of these... Some of these rules, sometimes when we see these drops or these free relief, whatever, it almost feels like they're just telling the guy, you know what, to help out, why don't you just pick it up and throw it as far as you can and and then just go play from there. We'll just get you on out of here. No problem. You'll be all good. (laughs) Just just throw it wherever it lands. We'll count that as your as your next drop. Right. It's uh, basically a hit and giggle out here. Might as well be Tiger's Hero World Challenge. But I, I do want to be be real for a second because I thought the Valspar was, or Copperhead, I thought was an excellent course. And again, the challenges, actual tests, and the the variance that a course like that provides. Like we saw Xander Shoffley went out and fired a 65 early on, a 6 under. And then we go and see... Keith Mitchell, who fires up six over, he ends up firing a 77, like courses like that, I think are, are so perfect and are uh, a great representation of, of what us fans want to see a little bit more consistently where, yeah, you're, you're still capable of making big charges up the leaderboard, but you're still never really too far out of it. And that's what made this event so great was like we mentioned right off the rip, the leaders uh, were at nine under, but you still felt like those guys who were at four or five with seven or eight holes left, you know, if they go post a score to get to seven or eight, like they have an opportunity. I, I really have always loved Copperhead. I've always loved the Valspar championship. I know it's in a little bit of a tough spot on the schedule considering it comes after two consecutive designated events, or at least it has the last two years. Um, but I wish this was a tournament that that more big names played and kind of got some more recognition because I, I personally think it's uh, a really fantastic course and also a good, like, tight test. I know it's not similar to the Masters, but I think it's a good course to kind of get you ready for major championship level golf, as does Bay Hill, as does TPC Sawgrass. And that's why, to me, the Florida Swing is arguably my favorite stretch of the entire schedule. I mean, we hit, we didn't even get to the shot of the week is Robbie Shelton's. Oh my gosh. Cross. Bobby shells it, from it, 258 out goes and holds it, it. And the best part is if you look at the layout and where he hit it from, he just said, fuck it. I'm going to go over those trees in, in hope. I know it was a, a it was just a, t- a shot where you're like, yeah, I'm one under on the tournament. I got absolutely no chance to go anywhere here. We're just going to go rip it and grip it. And sure enough, goes and drops that mug from 258 yards out. That was epic from Bobby Shells. And, and, and it was incredible camera work, once again, by the PGA Tour to pick it up to show not only how far of a shot that was, but how blind of a shot that was, that most of the guys were just laying up around that corner. And then he's just like, fuck it, I'm going to go over the trees. I know the green is over there somewhere. If I can, If I can clear the tree line and just get it over, it'll be close. And then the next thing he knows, he hears the scream and he just knows, oh, I dunked it. That's one of those where you're just like, there's absolutely no way that went in. Blind, through trees, watching the camera footage, the ball was in the air forever. I don't remember the last time we've gotten an albatross on the PGA Tour. It feels like it's it's been quite a while. So definitely the shot of the week from Robbie Shelton. I think second shot of the week probably goes to Peter Malnati for throwing that dart to like six feet on number 17. But yeah, I was happy with uh, the the tournament 
that Copperhead produced this week and usually produces year in and year out on the PGA Tour. But, Ross, now the PGA Tour does say adieu to Florida, and they head to the Lone Star State, Texas, for a two-week stretch, gearing up for Augusta National. It's not the greatest field that's teeing it up at Memorial Park Golf Course this week. It's a little top-heavy. We got some big dogs, but we got the world number one, the boogeyman. The man that is taking everyone's money. It's Scotty Scheffler coming in as a three to one favorite, already down to two and a half to one on some sites. Thinking about that in the year 2024 is absolute blasphemy. But we also got Wyndham Clark, the man who's beaten everyone besides Scotty Scheffler in each of his last two starts. Uh, Sahith Thigala, Will Zalatoris, Jason Day, Siwoo Kim. Those are kind of the big six, and then it kind of falls off a cliff a little bit. But um, we're two weeks closer to the Masters. What do you think about these five big dogs, six big dogs, I guess, that I just said right off the rip? Is it Scotty Scheffler for you like it is going to be for a lot of people? I don't know that I'm going to be able to bet that at three and a half to one, but uh, I know you got your picks, but I am just curious before you get into those, if any of these big dogs are part of them. Uh, and, and if not, which one of them would you lean towards this week? I, I do have I do have the big dogs in this just because this course has a lot of par fives. This course has manageable par fours where, you know, it, my my main feeling on the way this course plays is this course sets up for the big dogs with the big driver that if they can put it out there, you're setting yourself up with a great second shot. The par, the par fives are, are long. They, I mean, one of the par fives is over six is over 600 yards where I think what is going to set apart the field is going to be the guys that can get on in two. <clears throat> you know, the guys, the guys that can club up, crack the driver three thirty three with a little roll, maybe get to three fifty, and then put another two fifty. To 250, 280 off the three wood and, and be able to manage and go for it and get it on. So I do think the winner is coming from the big dogs. Um, I do. Um, I mean, I part of my list, I have Willie and I have Sahith in there only because of that driver that I think that driving along with the putting the way it's been for them. I think this is where one of those courses that's going to play to their strengths of gaining shots on the field between the driver and between the putting that if they're able to go and get those, get those birdies on the, the par fives, even Eagles, depending how close you can get it. I mean, length is going to be huge at this course. Yeah, this is a, a very, very long golf course and having a, a big, upside with the driver was a, was a main reason why I, I bet Tony Finau here in 2022, the last time that this tournament was held, actually, we didn't see it in 2023 because it had previously been part of the fall swing, but with the PGA tour, going back to a calendar year schedule for 2024, they now reverted the Houston open back to its original swing slot. But I think even more so in March, uh, the drive driver heavy players are going to have an advantage here because as I just mentioned, it's nearly a 7,500 yard golf course. And also Ross, uh, the fairways are pretty wide here, so you can go and give it a rip. And it sounds like the rough is going to be down from what they have previously had it. And that's a big part of what helped make this course difficult was uh, along with the length that had pretty penal 2.5 to three inch Bermuda grass rough. That's going to be down to one and a half inches. It sounds like this year. And it's also going to feature rye grass rough, which will produce like less flyers and less jumpers out of there and could possibly be a little bit more controllable for the field. So I do think the guys who can just grip it and rip it are going to have a big time advantage. And that's why I also do like Will Zalatoris, Sahith Thigala, two guys that I've also been on a ton so far here this season. I do think it's a good Wyndham Clark course too, because even when he's not hitting the driver, I mean, we saw him two weeks ago at the players reach a par five with two iron, two iron. And that was playing over 560 yards. So he can just absolutely stroke it a long way. But I agree. I, I do think this sets up nicely for one of the big dogs. The par fours are beasts. 
uh, nine or eight of the 10 play over 440 yards. Five of them can get up over 500 yards, depending on the tee boxes. It's very hard to make birdies on those holes. And as you referenced the par fives, they're long. Some of the toughest uh, three par fives on the entire PGA tour. Number 11, I believe it is gets up over 625 yards. So I think guys that can knock it on or get it close in two, And like you said, be able to come out of there with birdie is going to give them a major advantage. Um, but I also think you, you do still need all parts of the game to get by here. Um, you need a good short game. One noticeable change that was made to this course when Tom Doak led his uh, $19 million renovation process back in 2019 was along with Brooks Kepko, who was a player consultant, they cut down on a lot of the bunkers and the green side rough, and they just made a ton of runoff areas there. And uh, it does sound like it might've rained this week. So this could make the course a little bit softer, but usually they get baked out and it's just so hard to stop your ball. So you are going to need to have a good around the green game to get by here. And Looking at the past three winners uh, at the Houston Open since this has been moved to Memorial Park Golf Course, they've all finished inside the top 10 in strokes gain putting that week as well. So it, it just kind of feels like you do need to have that complete game going on to win on a course like this. Um, but again, it, it feels like this is just a, a another um, – carryover from what we've seen the last three weeks in Florida. It's not an easy birdie fest type of golf course. I do think it could get closer to 20 under this year because of that aforementioned rain. I believe Texas got thunderstorms here on Monday night. And also considering that the fairway rough isn't going to be as penal, but I, I still think the bombers are going to have the advantage here. The guys who are elite long iron specialists and are sturdy enough with the short game to get the job done. So I personally loved Will Z and Sahithi Gala off the top before I uh, get into my guys a little bit further on down the board, Ross, who are uh, you also interested in on this Monday <clears throat> afternoon, looking at the betting board. So a random name that I have had circled all day. I've, been running player comparisons, see where he adds up, because I see his name in the middle of the board, and it's not typically in the middle of the board. And so I did a little further research to see, and he compares, and he holds up. He doesn't have the length as much as the other guys do, but the rest of the game is well-rounded. I like the Kurt Kitayama at 50-1. to 1. Okay. that's I didn't expect you to go that way, quite honestly. Um, I haven't bet Kurt Kitayama a lot this year. And I do think for a guy who actually has winning upside, and we've seen it against the best players in the world, a guy who can hit his driver really well, I think that's a fair number. I might have to look a little bit more into that. I haven't given Kitayama much of a thought, but that's interesting. Who else have you been looking at? Uh, so like, like I said before, I do have Willie Z currently at the 20 to one, along with Sahith at 20 to one. Um, you mentioned it earlier, wide fairways, short rough, mash it the fuck down there and get it on. One guy that has already won this year playing yeah. that style of golf. I have Jake Knapp on my list again. Yeah, 60 to one. I think it, it's going to have to be part of my card. Um, look, Mexico was absolutely a weaker field than this, but this feels like a really good Jake Knapp golf course, does it not? We're we just outlined it like brute power strength guys who can mash the golf ball, be good the, enough with their short game to get the job done. That sounds like Jake Knapp, doesn't it? The, this, this course, just how you described it falls into the same shit that Smiley Kaufman said when he was on his show, the, Oh, just go down there and mash it. You're going to be fine when you find it. Yeah. What is that? When uh Smiley was like, Jake, you should play in Mexico, bud. Yeah, the, yeah. The, and, and, and told him, just, and he literally told him, just go down there and mash it. You're going to be fine when you find it. I promise. Yeah, you're just, exactly. You're, you're, you're going to be 40 yards further than everyone else, regardless. So, just, just so I, 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 it's part of the reason I, I like him this week that that course, the layout, the, the rough, the, the wider fairways, if he can just go down, keep it straight with his putting skill, I, I think, especially. You know, DraftKings currently has him at 55 to 1 from the 60 we're seeing. Still a great number for the fact that this course does set up really well for him. Yep, completely agree. Any other guys? Uh, la one, one last throw in because we're, we're on a roll with him. We love him. And when you read a stat that 
favors his direction. I do have Joel Damon for a top 10 again, um, currently at 7-1 to one odds. Um, Joel Damon's finished in the top 10 in this event at this course the past two years that he's played it. He did not play in 2023. He did finish T, uh, T10 in 2021 and T10 in 2022. Well, 2022 was the last time this was actually played because it was fall of 2022 at that time because that's when they had the wraparound going. So basically, each of his last two times he has played here, he has finished in the top 10. So I agree. Joel did not have the weekend that we were hoping for out of him, unfortunately. But hopefully... It it was a rough Sunday for sure for him. You You could see the shots were there. The putts just weren't going down. But he did have the opportunities where, you know, if he had knocked a few of those down, he was looking to creep to three or four under, but it they just did not drop for him. We're still always Joel Damon stands here on the show, but any other guys before I kind of get into some of uh, my early intriguing looks? No, those, those, those are, those are my four. If you if to look at outrights with the numbers, and then I have a Joel top 10 in there to make yourself a little cash. It, 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 it's a nice little number to make a little money off. If you throw a bet on it. I concur. Um, I, I will say, Obviously, the way that Wyndham has played recently and knowing that I was on him at the Players' Championship when he came oh so close to forcing that playoff with Scotty makes him, you know, uh, appealing to me this week. I don't love that 12-1 to number, but I certainly understand it. But uh, Bolsahith and Will Zalatoris were the two real looks for me at the top in the mid-range. I haven't made any official bets yet at this point in time, by the way. Just want to point that out there. And if you're watching this right now or listening to this, make sure to go and let us know in the comment section down below as to who you're tailing this week, who you like. If you agree with our picks, if you don't like them, make sure to go and let us know in the comment section. Also, go and follow uh, Golf on Tap on both Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. But the guys in the mid-range that I was checking out here early on in the week. Steven Yeager actually was a little intriguing to me for a 50 to one number. I thought Um, I mentioned Jake Knapp 60 to one. That number jumps off the page to me. Uh, Taylor Moore 80 to one ball striking ability, I think could translate well to this course. And then um, some shots down the board was nothing really too crazy. I thought Scott Stallings at 150 wasn't terrible, but uh, I honestly don't know how far down the board I'm going to want to get to just because I I haven't done it yet, but something tells me I'm probably going to be betting both Sahith and uh, Will Zalatoris, and that's going to really limit me the rest of the way. So I'm not exactly sure how many long shots I'm going to be squeezing in, but make sure to stay tuned. I think I'm going to be having a betting show with Joey Ricotta later on this week. So we'll be going through all of our final bets when that does go down and per usual, I'll still be having my, my golf gambling article come out, but yeah, we got Houston this week. We got the Valero Texas open next week in San Antonio and that's the masters at Augusta national Ross. And I do want to let all the people know officially that your boy will be there next week at the Valero Texas open at TPC San Antonio. I'm super pumped for it. The real question I have for you though, Ross is, are we going to see Tiger Woods there next week? Or is he just going to absolutely fucking basically go into the Masters with a fucking mentality this year? Um, For your sake and our sake as a team, I really hope he is there. And you are on the you are live boots on the ground, able to get us the on course content we need of Tiger Woods. But then another part of me, just I can't read Tiger anymore like we used to be able to read Tiger, where I'm I'm just not going to be surprised if he just w- walks in cold to Augusta and says, beat me, bitches. I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't agree with that mentality out of Tiger Woods, but at this point, I, I wouldn't be surprised. And Ross, I kind of mentioned this to you before we recorded, but it felt like it feels right now like all that progress that was going on in the fall and early on in the year and all that like confidence and all those discussions we had about Tiger Woods, like maybe playing once a month, maybe playing five, six, seven times this year. It's not even April and it feels like that's out the window, dude. It's not a good feeling. I'm not going to lie to you. It's, it's not a good feeling, but I also can see Tiger Woods with just his confidence and swagger, just skip all these events and show up at Augusta and just be in, just be in that locker room and essentially just show up cold and be like, huh, have you, have you won here before? Hmm. 
I mean, yeah, I get it. I get the confidence. But at 50 whatever years of age, he's got a round and a half of 48. 48. Come on. Sorry. 48 years old. You're telling me a round and a half in of competitive golf in 2024 with today's competition is going to be good enough. I think it's just foolish. And I don't listen. I don't know what his body's telling him, what everyone around him is telling him, what he's going through. I'm just a little confused. I'm just a little confused. If it was just the flu at Genesis, what's going on? You know what I mean? I don't know, man. <clears throat> For all our sakes, I hope we see him prior because golf is just more exciting with him in the field. But at this point, I I just I don't know if we're gonna be able to if we're gonna see if we're gonna see him do back to back weeks. Yeah. I, I just don't know. know if he has that in him. That is that is true. For my sake. I would love for him to be in Valero. I would love to see those crowds. I would love to see what it's like to watch the great Tiger Woods in person. But at the same point in time, similar to what you said, I don't have much confidence that it's going to be the case. And I have a feeling he's probably just going to cold turkey it into Augusta and hope that he can make the cut. And hey, if he can make it through four rounds there on that walk, um, I, I guess that's a positive sign in the right direction for Tiger. And we've been needing one for forever out of the guy. Yeah. I mean, we we're going on three years of still just waiting for anything to really happen. Yeah. It's been tough. Hopefully there are some, uh, there's some good news coming out of the Tiger Woods camp here coming soon. We'll see. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that he's going to be at Valero next week. Um, I'm super pumped to be down there, man. It's actually uh, an event that I've had on my radar for quite a while because my boy Corey Connors has won there twice, and it's the only place on the PGA Tour that he's ever won. I also have some family in the San Antonio area, so make sure to go and follow uh, golf or uh, at On Tap Golf on X. We'll be having boots on the ground next week at the Valero Texas Open. Ross. You got any final thoughts before we get out of here, brother? Good show as always. Not the most exciting event this week, but hey, we didn't think it was the most exciting last week, even going into Sunday and produced a pretty good finish. Good golf courses can do that. I think Memorial Park GC is one of those. Hey, man, we're getting closer and closer to just hearing the piano music, which is really all, all, all we need. Are you uh what are you working Masters Thursday and Friday? Unfortunately, what what's what's the master schedule for you? And do you have any like routines that you get into when it's Masters time? Uh, I I know for sure I'm remote on Friday, so I can sit and have that thing teed up in the back the the whole day. I'm working on I'm working on trying to see if I can squeeze that Thursday, and yeah. and just and just take it all in. But no, the, it's. It's the same. It's the same thing. I got my green. I got a green Masters hat. We rock golf attire all day, sitting on the couch, be all comfortable, drink drink some beers over the course of the days, and then just in, enjoy that piano, man. Oh my gosh, there is nothing like it. Thursday for me is also going to be dicey this year. I don't know if I'm going to be able to watch that first round, and it might break my heart not to. I think I'm going to have to figure out a way to do that. But Friday, I'll be feet up. Um, regardless whether I work or not on Thursday, early in the mornings, I still always get up and watch those first few pairings. Last two years, I've gone with some good old Mickey D's breakfast. It's been my master's special. Uh, and then mojitos. Mojitos, I was trying to think of the name of that drink. Like This was probably like a month ago, Ross, when we were doing the show. I was talking about my master's traditions, and it was a tradition that went back to college, and I couldn't think, the, think of the name of the drink, and it's mojitos. Every year. Masters weekend, we're drinking mojitos. So I'll certainly be having my Mickey Durs. I'll be having my mojitos. It couldn't come soon enough. Hopefully Tiger Woods will play some good golf. I'm super excited for it. I do make pimento cheese sandwiches just to oh. snack on. That's a good call. That's a good call. I might have to indulge in that. I actually saw yeah. there were like Masters food kits that you can order online. I saw those a couple for, of days ago. For, I didn't even it, know that was for, a thing. It's for a hundred bucks. They'll send you the the pimento cheese dip. They'll overnight it, as well as they have the master's glass, beer glass, it or beer plastic cups and everything. They'll send you too. So I actually might indulge in in that kit. We'll see. Maybe just sit and take it all in. Yeah. We'll see what's uh what's up our sleeve for Masters Week, but we're going to be having a ton of content coming out on Golf on Tap, so make sure to go and give us a follow on X. 
The username is actually reversed. It's at on tap golf because some jackass a couple of years ago took our Twitter handle before we nabbed it. Go and give me a follow on X at Jack Bushman too. You can find Ross at Ross John 22 as well. And again, if you haven't done so already, make sure to go and follow the show for free on either Apple podcasts or on Spotify so that if you're not watching live, you can still tune in to all of the latest episodes. Thank you again for everyone tuning in, be coming out with a final bet show, hopefully later on in the week. And I'll also be having an article coming out tomorrow afternoon as well. Make sure to go and check that out. And until next time, crack them, lock them, everyone enjoy the rest of your day.